You are about to listen to an audio replay of a PrayerfulLiving.com Learning Center seminar. This seminar replay is for the personal use of your household only. Duplication is also for your personal use and is not to be distributed. The seminar is copyrighted by the speaker. Please go to prayerfullivingshop.com slash learning center for more information on our teleconference seminar program or to purchase other seminars on audio replay. Welcome everyone to this Prayerful Living Learning Center live talk. We are so happy that you could be with us here today. Today's talk is titled Forgiveness. Our speaker is Pierre Prattervan and he's calling in from his home in Switzerland. Pierre asks, What if forgiveness were one of the greatest gifts you could ever make to yourself in your lifetime? Today, with Pierre, we'll explore how forgiveness, together with unconditional love, are the most important steps for anyone on their spiritual path. Pierre is author of the very popular book, The Gentle Art of Blessing, a simple practice that will transform you and your world, as well as 14 other books in numerous languages on topics spanning the fields of international development, spirituality, and personal growth. Pierre studied at universities in Geneva and Bern, Switzerland, and in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in the United States. He has had the privilege of living, traveling, doing research, or working in well over 40 countries on five continents in many capacities, including sociology, international journalism, as a program director in Africa, running programs for schools on third world education, as an international consultant, and presently as an adult trainer and writer. We are so grateful to have Pierre with us here in the Learning Center today. Welcome, Pierre. Hello, Mark. It's a great joy to be with you all, and good day to you, dear friends, or good evening for those who are in South Africa or Europe. During my talk, I will once or twice make a brief pause, simply so that an idea can maybe sink in a little more clearly. And for those who at the end are maybe too timid to ask a question themselves, on my website, gentleartofblessing.org, there is a question and answer section, so you might wish to ask a question in writing. It's truly a very great joy for me to talk about what has become one of the most in topics in my existence most important topics in my existence with unconditional love. I believe it is impossible to be truly and deeply satisfied and at peace if one has not totally forgiven everyone and everything in life, people, events in one's experience, maybe one's church, dramatic experience, the universe and life itself, and above all, oneself. Forgiveness has the most tremendous and amazing healing power. I love the story told by Jack Cornfield, one of the great American Buddhist teachers about this woman whose adolescent child was shot down by a 14-year-old boy who was a member of a gang, and he shot him simply to show his fellow gang members that he was now a man. Can you imagine that? And at the trial of this, 14 year old she stood in front of him and said I will kill you and as time went on he was of course put into an institution her thoughts changed deeply and she started visiting him at the institution and when he came out he had no place to go so she took him into her home and he became so integrated in the family that she ended by adopting him adopting the murderer of her son. That's what one calls total forgiveness. There's a wonderful, wonderful website called theforgivenessproject.com, in one word, The Forgiveness Project, which is based in London. And you have a host of very powerful stories on forgiveness. And there's one about the Green River Killer, who was the worst serial killer in the history of the United States. He killed close to 50 women after usually raping them and sometimes torturing them. And one woman who'd had her child 
uh, adolescent daughter raped and killed was looking at this TV program of the trial of the Green River Killer. And she was so full of hate. She prayed that the murderer of her daughter would be himself raped in prison and that he would die. And she realized that she was killing herself by harboring all this hate. And she fell upon this TV program where they were filming this trial of the Green River Killer. And all the families, one after another, were coming and making these victim impact statements and just spewing their hatred and their anger in the face of this man who sat there like a piece of granite with blue flint eyes and sometimes even a sardonic smile. And then a father came up whose daughter had been also murdered after being brutally hurt and raped. And he started speaking of forgiveness with a very gentle tone and saying that he and his wife had been inspired by Jesus and that they had decided to forgive this man. And suddenly, on the face of this granite-like face, tears started rolling down this man's cheeks. Maybe the only time in his life he'd ever cried. That is the power of forgiveness. And I'd like to share an experience I had, very powerful, where I found my release after 35 years of resentment. When as I was a young boy, I was raised in Geneva, Switzerland, in a very severe form of Protestantism called Calvinism, where guilt seemed to be the topmost emotion in life. And I was a model child, working the whole time, rendering services for neighbors or others, and nothing to reproach myself. And one day I was a member of this sort of fundamentalist Bible study group, and we went on a retreat with a well-known fundamentalist minister. And these are all young adolescents like me, you know, just so brave and so good and so pious. And he called us to repentance. And he told us that we had to repent. I didn't have the foggiest idea what I had to repent from. I'd never done anything wrong apart from occasionally taking a sugar in the special Sunday sugar bowl of the family. That's about the height of my criminal activity. And this man, suddenly, he mimicked the last judgment, the day of judgment, and he pretended he was God, and he was playing the role of God, and he pointed his finger at us, and he said, and you will come in front of the throne of God, and God will tell you, why did you not repent? And you might reply, well, I never had the opportunity to repent, and then he will point his finger at you, and he was doing this himself, pointing us and saying, liar, remember the retreat you did with Pastor Ray on such and such a date. And for me, it was so traumatic. I spent the rest of the evening lying on the floor of the little chapel in the form of a cross, begging God to repent me, although I didn't know what I had to repent from. And in the coming years, each time I would hear about him, or he was often on the radio, Something would flare up in me and I'd feel so angry and resentful. And then life went on, but I carried this at the bottom of my stomach for 35 years. And then I was at the home of dear friends in California. And I found a book called Unconditional Love and Forgiveness, published in 87, by an amazing woman called Edith Stauffer. And she gave a little exercise on forgiveness I'd like to share with you because it might help you or somebody you know who's in need of forgiveness or need to forgive. She said, forgiveness is a willingness to have a certain attitude. It's a willingness to go forward. It's a willingness to be more comfortable and to suffer less. It is a willingness to assume the responsibility of one's own self and let others assume the responsibility for themselves. And I love this sentence especially. Forgiveness is a decision to not punish oneself for the wrongs others have made or for other circumstances. It is a decision to enter into the flow of love and life. Because 
Of course, resentment is a form of self-punishment and even cruelty to oneself. And so there are a few steps. I will run through these first these different steps. The first step is you say, I choose to stop punishing myself and feeling bad for what such and such a person, in this case, Pastor Ray, did to me. The second step, imagine the person to whom you want to forgive. Imagine they are standing in front of you. You can close your eyes and you maintain in thought the image of this person and you say out loud to them, I would have so preferred that you had not done this. The third step you say, but you did do it. At that moment, you were at your highest level of consciousness. But I choose to let this incident go. I choose to let go of everything, all resentment, and be free. I choose to no longer go through life with this heavy load I imposed on myself. And the fourth step, which is the most important, you say, as a result, I annul all the expectations and demands I had that you could have behaved differently at that moment. I annul all inner demands and desires that you had behaved differently and with less judgment. You are entirely responsible for your actions and I am entirely responsible for mine. I give you back to your own good and I let you go. And the fifth step, you raise your eyes and your consciousness to the spiritual self with a capital S, our true identity. And you imagine the love this spiritual identity has for you. And you feel its compassion and its love. And you let that fill you and dissolve all expectations that you'd formulated or that you might have formulated towards the other person. And there are two more steps, but I will skip them. I did this little exercise twice in 35 minutes. And I felt like an old, tattered, smelly cloak was falling off my shoulders onto the ground and I got up free without a slight trace of resentment. I can recount the experience as I'm doing now, but it doesn't touch anything. No emotion inside me. On the contrary, I feel a certain sense of humor about the whole thing. Because if we truly have forgiven ourselves, we cannot harbor resentment towards anyone else. I said in the presentation of the talk that the greatest form of forgiveness, and I believe it's the only one really needed, is forgiving oneself. Because when we have really and truly totally forgiven ourselves, we can never harbor resentment towards anyone else. I repeat, when we have totally, completely forgiven ourselves for everything, we can harbor no resentment towards anyone else, any situation, any event, whatsoever. A few years ago, I felt right on top of the world, right in the green pastures. Everything was going well in my life. I was a successful trainer, very respected, a successful and respected writer in my region. I was known for my humanitarian work. And everybody admired my marriage. And I was on a 35 spiritual path on what I thought was the top of tops in terms of spirituality. And then in a matter of a few months, three or four at the most, everything crumbled. My marriage fell apart. I faced the main health claim in my whole existence, which was very dire medical predictions. My workshops crashed because my energy had crashed, hence my income crashed. And the spiritual path I'd been on for 35 years blew to smithereens. One of these things is bad enough, the five at the same time. 
It was just total hell. And for three years, I was in the darkest, darkest valley. It was a real tsunami that just raised everything in my life. And finally, I got out of it, thanks to a friend in Leeds in England who practiced something called matrix energetics. And she gave me a treatment, and I felt, in a matter of 30 minutes, my whole energy turning around. And I started going up after that. And today, I can say thank you for that experience. A sincere thank you. Because the spring cleaning was so necessary, especially of the spiritual pride which had led me to so naively believe that I had it all together for good, for once and for all, thanks to the teaching I then followed. So I really needed this dark valley to clear me up of that spiritual pride. The most challenging aspect but also the most rewarding, was forgiving myself for having set fire, so to speak, to my own green pastures. That took time, patience, and sincerity. And two statements helped me, especially in my darkest moments. One by Mary Baker Eddy. A deep sincerity is sure of success for God takes care of it. And especially just a thought that came to me out of the blue. You can always love Pierre. Whatever the circumstances, however dark the night surrounding you, you can always, always, always love. You can, friend, who are listening today, always, always love whatever ever the situation. It's something that depends solely on your commitment to love and not on any outward circumstance. I learned two very important lessons in that dark valley, the valley of the shadow of death. The first one is that each person is at every moment at their highest level of consciousness. And that includes that mean, despiteful church member who has been spreading the most malicious lies and gossip about you. The child rapist and murderer who's just been condemned to life in prison for life in your home state. Anyone and anyone. But the statement that each one is at every moment, at their highest level of consciousness, is also true of you, friend, of myself. It is true of every single person on the planet. For instance, however totally blind I was when I left my extraordinary, wonderful wife, I can now see that I was at that moment at my highest level of consciousness. Otherwise, I would have done otherwise. If I could have done better, I would have. I was terribly harsh with myself and went into a tailspin of deep depression. But now that I have forgiven myself, I can really see that at every single moment, I was then at my highest level of consciousness. The second essential point I learned is the vital importance of loving myself. I was known and appreciated for apparently being a most loving person, but somehow that did not really include myself. But just as one cannot truly forgive others if one has not totally forgiven oneself, I feel my love for others at that time still lacked a dimension of tender compassion that feel I have gained since coming through my valley of death. The 
the present moment, I'm writing a second book on blessing. The first one was The Gentle Art of Blessing. Mark mentioned this. And I'm now preparing a book of 365 blessings, one for every day of the year. I'm just over 280, so I still have a little less than 100 to go. I hope the book will appear next year. And I'd like to read one of the daily blessings of this book, which is on forgiveness. It is introduced by a brief statement where I say, I believe it is impossible to live a happy life if one nourishes resentment for some harm done to oneself or guilt or repressed anger for an error or omission of omission or commission we cause. On the other hand, we become incapable of resentment when we have understood that everyone is at every moment at the highest level of consciousness. We then live in deep peace and quiet joy. So here is the blessing. I bless myself in my ability to understand that forgiveness is one of the greatest gifts I could ever make to myself and to the world. I bless myself in my understanding that when I refuse to forgive, I make an unconscious choice to suffer. When I refuse to forgive, I make an unconscious choice to suffer. That's so important to understand. I bless myself in the understanding that the prisoner I'm freeing when I forgive is myself. Because resentment is like a rat that is eating up your entrails. You all have felt resentment, how horrible it is. So I bless myself in the understanding that the prisoner I am freeing when I forgive is myself. I bless myself in the understanding that when I forgive or request forgiveness, I not only free myself, but help free all others and elevate world consciousness. And above all, I bless myself in my ability to forgive myself of any and every mistake or harm I ever occasioned to myself or to others so as to walk free, head high, and my heart singing. I'd like to repeat the statement. It's so important. I bless myself in the understanding that when I forgive, I not only free myself, but help free all others and elevate world consciousness. Every victory over ourselves, be it over sensuality or alcoholism or hatred or lack of truthfulness, whatever, in overcoming that error, we are helping every single person on the planet overcome the same error. When we overcome hatred in ourselves, we are helping all those on the planet suffering from the same hatred. That is so wonderful to realize that. It's such a gift to oneself to realize that. A very helpful insight into total forgiveness of others is understanding that our neighbor is oneself. I believe this is an insight I picked up in that fabulous book, The Wisdom Jesus by Cynthia Borjo, by far my favorite book on Jesus, The Wisdom Jesus by Cynthia Borjo. She mentions, at least I believe it's in this book that I found this mention, there is an old Aramaic version of the second commandment which says exactly this. My neighbor is myself. Not, I love my neighbor as myself, but I love my neighbor who is myself. For anyone steeped, for instance, in the teaching of Mary Baker Eddy, for instance, or any other non-dual teaching, this should be evident. If all is life, 
and its infinite manifestation, then it is a foregone conclusion that my neighbor is myself. Because we are the same life expressing itself. But I had never really grasped that until reading the wisdom of Jesus. Since then, I have discovered Joel Goldsmith, who has become a sort of spiritual mentor or guide for me. I receive beautiful daily quotations on internet at the following address, megacomiw at verizon.net. I repeat, megacom, I like Irene, W like William, all linked together at verizon.net. Joel says, the only road to a successful and satisfying life is understanding our neighbor is ourself. That's from his book, Practicing the Present, which is the most important of his books after The Infinite Way. I repeat, the only road to successful and satisfying life is to understand our neighbor to be ourself. Once we have understood this evident conclusion of this alternative version of the second commandment, we cannot hold a single grudge against anyone on earth, because that would also be a way of holding a grudge against oneself. Joel says that no one can come into his consciousness who needs forgiveness because he has already forgiven them 70 times 7. And quite honestly, friends, I feel I can say exactly the same thing today. And it gives one the most wonderful form of peace. I can really say no one can enter my consciousness today who needs forgiveness because I have already forgiven him or her in advance because I have so clearly understood that at that moment they are at their highest level of consciousness. Maybe it is this vision that inspired the most beautiful prayer of forgiveness I have ever come across. It was found tucked under the body of a dead baby who was in one of the Nazi extermination camps, and the one at Ravensbrücke. His Jewish mother must have written this prayer after he died, and it was found by the U.S. soldiers who liberated the camp. And it's from a book by Dennis Lynn and Sheila Fabricant called Simple Ways to Pray for Healing. So hear this prayer written by a Jewish mother after her baby had died in the horrendous conditions of this death camp. Lord, remember not only the men and women of good will, but also those of ill will. But do not only remember the suffering they have inflicted on us, remember the fruits we have brought forth thanks to this suffering, our comradeship, our humility, the courage, generosity, the greatness of heart which has grown out of all this, and when they come to judgment, let all the fruits we have borne be their forgiveness. Imagine your baby child has just been killed by a system run by cruel guards with apparent hearts of stone. And you write this prayer. Are we listening? Are we truly listening? For the past 19 years, I've been corresponding 
with the most amazing gentleman who was 25 years on death row, 30 years in prison for a crime that his close friends and myself know he never committed. At least it's our deep, deep conviction that he never committed this crime for which he was condemned to death at one time. I've written a book on this amazing man who has become a spiritual guide and mentor to hundreds of people around the world, including some very, very remarkable people like a German countess, a well-known French writer and many others. And of course, he's become a spiritual mentor also for me. And this man, I've written a book on him called Messages of Life from Death Row. Messages of Life from Death Row. You will only find it on Amazon because it was printed on internet. And this book has turned around the life of dozens and dozens and possibly hundreds of people. And last year I gave a talk at a meeting in France, a large forum, on the theme of the Great Crossing, the Great Crossing being death. And I was asked to contribute a message concerning this friend on death row, Texas, concerning Wayne. And I asked Wayne to write the message himself. And I just read it. So here's the text by Wayne for this Great Crossing conference in France. And again, he's on death row, Texas, which is probably one of the closest places to hell on the planet with tiny cells, no contact whatsoever with any human beings apart from the guards who push them to the shower in tiny 10 by 6 foot cells with only a tiny slither of light under the ceiling so they never see outside. And there's a great violence, there's constant noise, and food is appalling, really the end of hell. And he writes from this place. Hello, my friend. I hope you are having a wonderful and exciting day sharing and spreading universal love and peace. Nothing happens overnight. At least that is what is said. And it is true for many things, even though my transition didn't happen overnight. My journey to reach that point took years. I went through some of the most horrible moments of my life during those times. Doubt, fear, anger and hate were my constant companion. These feelings were there when I woke in the morning, and more times than I can count, they kept me from sleep at night. I stopped talking to people because I couldn't find the words to express what I was feeling. I was so angry that it physically affected me. I became so angry at one point that my stomach began to hurt so badly that my blood pressure rose to unhealthy levels, and I didn't care if I lived or died. I came from a home where all my young life was filled with love and compassion from a great grandmother that did her best to shower me with love and affection. Even though many days we went without food until my mother's government check came on the first of each month. There were those times when I had to attend school during winter months without shoes and without a coat to keep me warm. There were many things I lacked as a child, but love and compassion not one of them. I was taught to forgive. So I knew what was happening to me was not natural. And I knew I had to change to stop the hate consuming me. But I didn't know how. It had become such a part of me that getting rid of it was like cutting off a body part. It would be painful. At least that's what I told myself. But I realized that living with it was more painful than living without it. I thought that hate and anger was justified given my treatment by the system that had confined me. I think anger at some point is acceptable under certain conditions, but hatred never. One afternoon I became so angry that my chest began to hurt so bad that I thought I was going to die. I lay on my bed and I closed my eyes. I asked God to help me. I couldn't do it alone and I couldn't live like this anymore. And at that moment, I heard a voice reaching across time, defying the silence of the grave, warm, caressing, understanding, and filled with love. And this voice, the voice of my great-grandmother saying to me, Wayne, 
You can only change what you can touch by what you can't touch. She said, you can't touch the heart, but the heart can touch you. Let it touch you. Let it heal you. She said, pray and open your heart so that love can make itself heard. I got out of my bed, kneeled on the floor, and I began to pray. The next day, I received a book from a man who has become more than a brother, more than a friend, a man who embodied all that love is and who would teach me so much about love, dedication, and sacrifice, my soulmate. It was a book about blessing titled The Gentle Art of Blessing, and from that point, nothing would be the same. It seemed that overnight my life changed because I was ready for a change, because I needed to be change. I had reached the breaking point of my life, and it was either change or be broken, so change it was. You may wonder why it took so long to find love and peace. The thing is, I didn't have to find it. It was there all the time, waiting for me to embrace it. I didn't have to find love and peace. It was there all the time, waiting for me to embrace it. Over the years, I have come to understand that all things occur at their proper time. But I also recognize that some of our journeys will be fraught with many difficulties and more turbulence than others. I don't know why that is, but I'm perfectly fine knowing that there are certain questions we will never find answers to because the universe keeps its most precious secrets hidden so as to keep us searching, I suppose. I guess I was one of those people who's chosen to be tested by far. I guess you could also say that's not fair. Why should my life be any more difficult than anyone else's? Another mystery the universe keeps to itself, I suppose. But cry no tears for me. I love life, every minute of it. I love every challenge of it that I face. I love knowing that I can make a difference in other people's lives here. I love knowing that someone can become whole now. At one time in my life, I was in pieces. And I thank God that love was the glue that made me whole. I came to realize that we all have to be someplace, and it's not where we are that matters, but what impact we have on where we find ourselves that does. I am where I am, and where I am needs love more than any other place I can think of at the moment. I came to accept the fact that we are where we are for a reason, and we must attempt to leave it better than it was before we came. I found love, and with it came peace, if said simply. And to accept the understanding that what I can change, I must change. And what I can't change means I must change. To accept the understanding that what I can change, I must change. And that what I can't doesn't mean that I stop trying. But through my efforts, I find peace in knowing that I give it my all. So don't think for a moment that I've come to accept my confinement. I would never do that. I simply understand and accept the role I have been given to play in it. Again, simply said, I embraced love and love brought me peace. And peace led me to the joy I feel in my heart each day and every day when I wake up each morning with a prayer on my lips and a song in my heart. That's written from Death Row, Texas. Can you say the same thing when you wake up each morning? I would like now to conclude on the theme I have not read about anywhere on any recent book on forgiveness, and that is national forgiveness and national repentance. You have probably all heard of the law of karma, 
which is simply a modern widespread expression well it's not modern because it comes from india thousands of years ago but in the west it's been used only in recent years and it's a very simple way of expressing of describing the law of cause and effect which jesus expressed when he said we will reap what we sow so when i speak of the law of karma i'm referring to that statement by jesus we reap what we sow Negative karma weighs very heavy on us until we have cleaned up our own act. And the same is true for countries. Some European countries accumulated a very heavy karma through colonization. Countries like Great Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, even aristocratic families in my home country, Switzerland, were involved in the slave trade. And very more recently, since the last war, Switzerland accumulated a very heavy karma through our corrupt banking practices. When I say corrupt, morally corrupt. We accepted the money, all the dirty money from all over the world, especially innumerable dictators. In that manner, Switzerland probably betted or caused the death of hundreds of thousands of innocent poor in the third world. That is something we need to repent and for which we will carry karma until we do repent. The United States is also a victim of a great amount of violence. Between 1968 and 2011, more people were killed by firearms, 1.4 million, than in all the war, all the wars ever fought by the US, including the War of Independence, 1.2 million. But as you are aware, there is immense violence in the USA. It has the highest crime rate in the Western world. 44 people are killed every single day. And 300 million citizens own, well, there are 300 million guns around the country, which is almost one per capita. And I believe that as a nation, the U.S. is reaping the terrible things done to the native populations of the U.S. Their own country, their precious land, was stolen from them. And in the process, thousands were killed, many, possibly many more. They were parked in second-rate zones, while well-meaning and ignorant missionaries and others totally deprived them of their own culture. By the way, over 270 treatises were signed with the Indian nations, because they were considered nations by the U.S., and every single one was broken. There have been many books written on this, and you can find them easily. One I remember that touched me a lot was bury my heart at wounded knee. And the same thing happened with the black population of the U.S. They were kidnapped in their own villages in Africa, ferried like chattel with incredible violence across the Atlantic. And again, Swiss aristocrats took part in this trade and cruelly exploited. A very recent book, The Half That Has Never Been Told, by Edward E. Baptist. I repeat, the half that has never been told, Edward E. Baptist, shows how the prosperity of the U.S. was essentially based on slavery. This terrible violence that lasted for centuries and still continues in some aspects today was not only never healed, but continues to fester in the collective subconscious of the country. I believe it explains a great part of the violence going on in the USA. And I'm also convinced that until there is a collective gesture of repentance and a request for forgiveness towards the native and black populations of this country, the negative karma will continue to fester and poison the social and racial relations 
of this country, just as in Switzerland, the negative karma of bank secrecy will continue to fester until its horrendous results are recognized and corrected. Quite a lot has happened in respect to, in recent years, to make it more difficult to stash away billions, and I repeat billions, by dictators, but nothing has been done to correct the harm that was done in the years between, let's say, 1950 and 2000, 2005. And I do very much hope no one among the listeners today will make bland and displaced metaphysical statements of the sort, oh, well, that never really happened, or God knows nothing about this. Of course she doesn't. But to the American Indian and black populations, it was terribly real, and still is. So both individually and collectively, asking forgiveness is something very powerful. Let me tell you stories that touch me deeply. The first one is the story of a Danish friend and her daughter, Juliet. Danish friend was called Karen, and her daughter was called Juliet. Karen put up with a marital life of constant infidelity for close to 20 years and then finally she decided she could no longer put up with this and she divorced and her daughter Juliet who was very attached to her father didn't forgive her this separation and each time they met and I was often witness to these scenes each time they met after a few minutes it would flare up between them. And one day a friend of Karen said, look, Karen, why don't you write a letter of asking forgiveness of your daughter? And Karen just blew up and she said, what? Me? Ask forgiveness? But you know what my former husband did to me? You know how I was deceived for 20 years and my daughter knows that too? And her friend said, yes, Karen, but... You see, your daughter didn't live the same experience as you. And for her, it was a very dramatic thing to be separated from her father, even though you had excellent reason. Well, Karen listened to this, and she composed a beautiful letter. As a matter of fact, she composed it at my chalet, my chalet 7,000 feet where I give my summer workshops, and sent it to her daughter, And from one day to another, the relations of Karen and Juliet were totally transformed. Now Juliet is her dearest and closest friend. That's the power of asking forgiveness. The other second story is by a very dear friend of mine called David. We were were so close. Our families were very close. We went to the same grade school together. We went to the scouts together. We went to the same parish uh, catechism together and we founded a quatuor of spirituals to sing spirituals. We both loved spirituals when we were adolescents. We were inseparable. And as a matter of fact, people called us David and Jonathan. And then our paths separated. My friend David went to become an engineer, I did classical studies and went to the university and he married and he had two marriages which ended in the most dramatic divorces I've ever seen, ever witnessed. They were so terrible. And I forgot to add one important part of the story. When he was a teenager in the parish youth, he started dating a lovely young woman and they started speaking about marriage. And then he broke up from one day to another. He quit her from one day to another because another young girl had, you know, attracted his fancy. And his girlfriend was absolutely desperate. She would sometimes come to her home and cry. And then she went on to a brilliant career in in the field of health. And again, I say, my friend encountered two of the most terrible divorces I've ever witnessed. And 
One day he was then living in the States. I passed at his home and I said, you know, why don't you come back to Switzerland? You can stay with us as long as you like. You can look for a new job and try and settle and create a new life. And he did that. He came and stayed with us and then found a little apartment for himself. And he wrote a letter to his teenage girlfriend saying how he regretted his behavior. That was 40 or 45 years before. And he ended the letter by saying, I just wanted you to know how I regret my behavior 45 years ago. You don't have to reply. Well, his former girlfriend, 45 years before, with whom I had kept close contact, told me first that letter irritated me and I pushed it back on my desk. But I didn't throw it away. And sometime later I thought, well, I'll reply. And they started corresponding. Then they met. And the miracle happened. They fell in love again, head over heels, and they've been now married 12 years. And it's one of the happiest couples I know of. And that is because he asked for forgiveness and she granted forgiveness. But maybe the most amazing story of forgiveness, and I will conclude on this note, was a very dear French friend. When she was a young woman, she was 18 then, she met a young man and they fell head over heels in love and it was one of those very passionate, romantic youth attractions and they married and they had two beautiful, intelligent, lively children who at the time were four and six years old and the marriage soured and she decided to divorce and the husband didn't want to hear about the divorce but she went ahead with her plans and she went to see a lawyer and then she had to go into a clinic for some reason. Then she said to her lawyer, please be sure that the divorce papers are not served on my husband while I'm in the clinic because I don't know what he could do. And the lawyer said, don't worry, we will be sure about that. And she entered the clinic and the very same day, the divorce papers arrived at her home. The husband tried to reach her in the clinic, but they wouldn't give him his own wife. And that night, he turned on the gas in the house and committed suicide with the two children. But it's not the end. They cut the electricity in region for regions on high-tension cables, and they reestablished a contact in the night, and a spark was ignited in the house. And as it was full of gas, there was a big explosion. And the whole house was burnt to ashes. And my friend lost absolutely everything. And I mean everything she had on earth. Her letters, her jewelry, her dresses, her books, everything. And she embarked on a seven-year search for forgiveness that took her from Pharaoh's tombs in the pyramids in Egypt to the Andes, to India, to visit gurus. And seven years later, standing by in Benares, next to the Ganges, where they burn the, the cadavers of people, cremate people, and pour the cinders in the Ganges, suddenly she had a vision that human body is just a dream, an evanescence, and that real life continues. Now, I think I would like to finish by just telling you a small exercise, and then we will conclude. A small exercise forgiveness exercise. I've been doing it 15 years in my personal development workshops. It's to let go of resentment. If anyone listening has some deep resentment or you know someone who's suffering from resentment, I suggest you go into nature, into a spot where you are fairly secluded and look for a large stone and something at least three, four pounds. And I've seen people carry 15 pound stones in my workshops up a steep hill and you take that stone in your hands and you walk around for a quarter of an hour making one single statement you can do it out loud or gent softly i am carrying the stone the stone is not carrying me the minute I want to let go of the stone, I can choose to do so. And of course, the stone represents 
forgiveness. So I repeat, you go around walking with this big stone, repeating, I am carrying the stone. The stone is not carrying me. The minute I want to let go of the stone, I can do so. And when you feel ready, you can put it down. I wonder if Pierre can give us the place where we can find that incredible prayer that was found under the baby's body. It's in the book by Dennis Lynn, L-I-N-N, and Sheila Fabricant, Fabricant, as you pronounce it. The book is called Simple Ways to Pray for Healing. The stone represents what? The stone represents the resentment you are suffering from. And it's, by the way, a very powerful exercise. I've seen, you know, people deeply transformed. I would like if you could maybe just outline very briefly what specific role Christian science played in your understanding of forgiveness. That's an interesting question. I can't think specifically of a role of Christian science in relation to forgiveness. I think it's more the realization that all is one, which enables me to understand more clearly the alternative version of the second commandment, love your neighbor who is yourself. And as I said, if all is infinite life and it's infinite manifestation, then everything alive is part of the same entity as I. And this includes animals and it includes plants. There is no separation. So necessarily, if I feel resentment towards someone, I'm feeling resentment towards myself. And if I forgive myself completely, and I mean completely and totally, then I will automatically forgive all others. I'm wondering when you say that you need to understand that a person is at their highest level of consciousness. Are you saying that it's sort of saying that this is the best we can each do at this time because of circumstances or whatever? Yes, exactly. The president of Syria at the moment, who is described as one of the greatest monsters on the planet today, he is at his highest level of consciousness and I cannot condemn him. I can only love him and surround him with compassion. He will have to repent the evil he has done, and he will have to carry the cross of what he has perpetrated. But maybe he has come to help us as a race learn the lesson that division leads nowhere. All these horrendous things are leading us to clearer understanding that oneness is the only solution. Realizing we are all one. That's why identifying with a nation for me is really passé. I mean, it's 19th century. I have a Swiss passport because at the moment the world is organized into nations. But I don't feel especially Swiss. I feel really a citizen of the world. You mentioned a book called Practicing the Present. Practicing the Present by Joel Goldsmith. He was a a great American mystic of the last century and an extraordinary healer. And he found a teaching called The Infinite Way. What was the complete title about messages of life from death row? Is that the whole title? That's the whole title of my book on this my correspondence with this death row inmate who has become now a, a sort of spiritual teacher to hundreds of people. I've read your Gentle Art of Blessing, and I love it. I'm looking forward to your book of blessings when you get it done. Thank you. <laughs> In my book on the Gentle Art of Blessing, towards the end of the book, there is this extraordinary story 
of a Christian scientist in Rwanda during this terrible genocide of 1994. This man has now become the first teacher in Democratic Republic of Congo, the first CS teacher. And at the time he was living with his house, and you remember maybe that the 800,000 to a million people were killed in the most horrendous manner after their bodies cut up with machetes. And his house was invaded at one o'clock in the morning. And he immediately started making affirmations of truth and sending love to these people who were completely crazy. They were as drunken with blood and hatred. And for half an hour, they ranted and raved and screamed and didn't do anything to anybody. And then they went into the living room. And for two hours, he continued his spiritual work. And they came back completely transformed. Completely. They confessed all the crimes they'd committed and they left the house without touching anyone. Well, we need to do the same thing. We can't do it maybe in direct encounters, but we can do it in the secrecy of our homes. Love them, love them, love them. I have immense compassion for these young Islamic men you saw on TV who were cutting the throats of people, murdering them on TV. I feel such incredible compassion because they've taken such a heavy load, such a heavy karma on themselves. And if my love for them can help them a a tiny bit, well, that's all I want. The national karma that you were talking about, and I find that a little confusing because I don't have any hatred or animosity towards Indians or... Well, I hope not. Heavens! (laughs) I hope not. But maybe you could have towards the perpetrators of all these crimes, those who killed them by the thousands and stole their land. You might have a little anger. I did for a long time. Well, I don't think it was right. I guess I'm having a hard time understanding who is it that I am forgiving. Or we need to forgive nationally there. I mean, there's been a lot of national stuff on all sides. You need to repent, not forgive. I spoke about repentance also. You need to repent as a nation. The terrible injustice done to the Native Americans and the African Americans, just as we in Switzerland, one day will have to repent the horrendous corruption, our banking system enabled in the whole world. And we are very far from that, believe me, very far. So we'll carry the weight of this karma until we change our rules and our regulations and our mode of operation. I could very well see a president of the United States making a collective statement asking the Indian nations and the African Americans forgiveness for all the harm done to them. One day, I hope someone will. Same in Switzerland. I hope one day some president of our country will ask forgiveness of all the people who died because of our banking practices. All right, Pierre. Well, thank you so very much. We're so grateful for your presentation today and taking the time to share with all of us. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, why we have recorded the event and we will make it available on the website. If you'd like to purchase the replay, either in a downloadable form or on CD, we'll have it available on prayerfulliving.com slash learning center. Thank you so much, Pierre. God bless. God bless. And as a parting word that if it has helped one single person, for me, it was worthwhile. Goodbye.